So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, be here for our first OBSSR Director's Webinar Series. Um, I would say it's new. It's both new and old. Um, for many years we had a lecture series at OBSSR. Uh, as people's schedules got busier and webcasts allowed them to uh, do things remotely more conveniently, we finally decided we would cut the analog cord for good and go to a fully digital um, form of our lecture series. So this is the first of our webinar uh, lecture series. So I um, want to thank you all for being here. I'll let you know that each month um, we'll be doing a, a different presentation around uh, behavioral and social science research um, that um, is impactful and that illustrates the sort of things that we're looking at within the strategic plan for OBSSR. Um, with that, I want to keep this short and sweet and to the point so that our speaker has plenty of time. And I'm going to begin by introducing uh, Dr. Bill Elwood, who uh, co-leads our coordination efforts, our communication efforts here at uh, OBSSR, and turn it over to him to introduce our speaker for this month. So, Bill. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Uh, um, our first speaker in this series is Dr. Michael Hecht, uh, the current co-president of Real Prevention. A, a small business dedicated to uh, um, promote the promotion and dissemination of keeping it real. A long-term uh, um, NIDA and other organizationally funded intervention uh, um, that's uh, been done over the past couple of conducted over the past couple of decades uh, um, in Arizona, in Pennsylvania, uh, um, and now internationally. Um, prior to uh, of becoming co-president of Real Prevention, uh, um, Michael's uh, most previous position from which he retired was Distinguished University Professor at uh, Penn State University. Let me turn things over to you, Michael. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you for that generous and kind introduction, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to talking to you and hearing your feedback on some work that we've been doing at Real Prevention with my colleagues, Dr. Michelle Mouladay, and Dr. Ann Ray. And with that, I think we'll go to the PowerPoint. So we're going to talk today about translating theory and practice into health message design and evaluation research. Um, the story begins with Michael and Michelle doing research and uh, looking at narrative health stories and how stories impact uh, behaviors, health behaviors, and the role of cultural and culture and cultural grounding in that process. And I, I want to say that we were working from what I call the build it and they will come model. We thought as scientists, we would build and test and establish an intervention. We would put it out there and people would come. And that's the framework that we were working from. And so we started with this intervention that came to be known as Keeping It Real, which was uh, a drug prevention intervention initially funded by NIDA and again, as Bill said, by other people. And um, it was a school-based intervention and our goal was to conduct the research and publish. Uh, formative research focused on what happens when youth, youth are offered drugs and uh, what the situations were, who was involved, what did they say, it was a communication study. And we also looked at things like risk and resiliency and social norms. Uh, that formative research was then used to develop and evaluate the school-based prevention, and in particular, looking at culturally targeted uh, messages as well as monthly cultural messages. We were initially working in Phoenix, Arizona, which had a large Latino population, and so the, uh, the curriculum was targeted towards Latino, African American, and white audiences, and we compared that to a multicultural intervention. Um, the reason we approached it through a narrative framework is that narratives are a very powerful message form that overcome resistance, they reach audiences that are not engaged, they render complex information comprehensible, and they do a very good job of representing culture. So it's a message form that's very, very powerful and useful for us in the health field. And I think it's been getting a lot of attention um, over the past, let's say, decade or so. Um, Michelle and I developed what we call narrative engagement theory in which we look at narrative messages. And in some ways, our narrative messages differ from some of the other people out there in that it, it is told in story form. It's not just an individual talking to people. So right now, I, I started off by telling you the story began, framed it as a narrative, but I'm very much talking a didactic form rather than a narrative form. And our model would then predict that people would become engaged 
and that by providing mental and behavioral models of, of healthy behavior, and that would allow us to influence skills and norms and attitudes and intents. The other component that's a little unique to this is the idea that stories get talked about. And so, for example, in our, one of our studies, 94% of the kids that had Keep It Real talked about it, and almost every one of them in a positive way. So it, 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 it socially diffuses through the networks, and that ultimately should affect the health behaviors. Um, so the question was, did it work? And we have conducted three group randomized clinical trials, and they do show that Keep It Real reduces alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana use. Uh, an independent study uh, conducted through SAMHSA showed a cost-benefit ratio of 28 to 1, which uh, frankly surprised me um, and pleased me. And so we had this intervention. We had developed it through research. We had tested it through evaluation, clinical trial designs, published the research in the best journals. And uh, just as a graphic representation of the first study and the effects that we got at 14 months, you can see the, the differences um, in the various different substances um, in this graph. So um, many of you know about NREP, the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. They and other uh, listing agencies uh, noted us as an evidence-based program, and the, so that, that allowed the story to be continued and spread fairly widely around the country and around the world. Um, as a result, Discovery, Discovery Channel, Discovery Health approached us about um, disseminated at ETR, publishing disseminated, and Penn State attempted to disseminate it as well. And so there were these devices for getting the word out as, as uh, build it, and they will come model people. We thought we'd throw it out there and they it would get done. And, um, and so we're at the kind of point where the, the substance of this story, I think, is, uh, uh, comes into play because um, the word did not get out effectively, and um, we were faced with what I would consider to be a failure of dissemination practices for a variety of reasons. And, and, and so let me talk about what were some of the barriers and obstacles that we, that we faced. Well, first of all, it, initially through Penn State, we thought we would disseminate it, and we had no time to do that. We were faculty. We had full-time jobs. We had no money to disseminate it. We couldn't print copies. We couldn't make copies. Couldn't mail them out. We had no staff to do that. We had no space to store things and work from, and we had very limited technology to, to make any of this happen. We also um, lacked control once it went through uh, Discovery Health and ETR of the method of dissemination. So Discovery Health was putting us in a, a group of health interventions, and we discovered once we were up and running that we were the only evidence-based practice there, and they were charging an exorbitant amount of money, and if people wanted to use Keep It Real, they had to buy the whole package, for example. And that limited the distribution quite a bit. Um, ETR was licensed uh, by Arizona State, where we were formally, and therefore we had no control over what they did with the curriculum at all. Um, and uh, so there was a lack of clarity initially in, in our development process, as well as in our dissemination process about what we were hoping to do, and partly was because we had no idea that we had to think about those things. Um, so what were some of the challenges once we got out into the field? Um, as many of you know, implementation and implementation quality is a, is a serious problem once you're not running a tightly controlled clinical trial and watching and observing and monitoring the implementers and controlling their behaviors as best you can. Um, national surveys show that the, the curricula tend not, evidence practices tend, tend not to be used when they use they don't tend to use the whole thing. We're following up with the most recent clinical trial and a couple of the, the schools that are still using the curriculum are using two of the 10 lessons and explaining they're using them because they're evidence-based. Um, and so when people do this, they tend to assume that the practices can be implemented with fidelity and that they will be well implemented. And once you're out in the field, you lose control over that in all likelihood. You lose fidelity and you lose implementation quality. It just seems to be um, an assumption that is not well justified. And so this idea of evidence-based is typically evidence-based only when the person is studying it and controlling the implementation tightly. Um, that's why I put it in quotes. 
Um, recently, there was a Cochrane review of flossing, dental floss, which caught my attention through a New York Times article about it. And they, they were doing uh, the, the typical reviews that they do. And they found basically that flossing had very limited information, spite of the fact that um, it's so widely disseminated and uh, people make so many assumptions about its effectiveness. But the six studies that looked explicitly about flossing when it was done professionally all show very, very strong evidence. And that speaks to the point of how well something gets implemented. So uh, flossing only works when it's done properly. Our prevention curricula and our health messages, our health promotion messages, only work probably when they're done with fidelity and well implemented. And we can't assume that that's going to happen when we take things to scale. Um, and so that, as we began to do this and we were faced with this challenges, these challenges, it began to, to um, ask, raise, raise questions about who is going to implement it, who is going to adapt it, who is going to train, how, is, how are people going to be trained, and most importantly, something that I think we know very little about, how are we going to provide technical support to people? Um, we have attempted in the various times to uh, impose or construct or offer technical support systems. And in most cases, we've been very unsuccessful in doing that. So is there another model? And what we would call a community engagement model is um, one that we've adopted and been using for quite a while now. Um, and, and the one thing I want you to note about the graphic is there are people involved, and they're all working on different parts of the puzzle. And that will become relevant in a few moments. So what is a community-engaged project? Um, it's done in the community. It involves the community. The community is the partner. They have to be engaged. And it is designed with and for the end user. And so one of the things that we always did was, um, in our drug prevention work, was work with kids and develop the stories from the kids, develop the lessons with the teachers that were going to use it, and maybe more, most importantly, the video component, which is a key component to what we do, were developed and filmed by other kids, for kids. And um, these, these videos prevent problematic situations, and the, they start lessons, and then the kids will discuss the lessons and substitute and assert their own nar narratives, therefore uh, tailoring and customizing, in a sense, as an ongoing part of implementation. And so in that way, the implementer is freed from having to change it as much as they would in a different type of curriculum. But the design for an end, end user is important. I should also note that we don't use the term um, community-based participatory research because of um, the various definitions that have been applied to that, and we don't necessarily fit all of that. I, I hearken you back to that image that we had before. While the community is a partner, we don't expect them and all the, the constituents that are involved to be knowledgeable about everything that we're doing. They're not clearly going to design the clinical trial. They will be involved in it and they will be involved somewhat in the design of it, but not as the researcher. Um, so our health message design principles are based on narrative engagement and cultural grounding, um, starting with the story, starting with the people who are going to receive the intervention and are going to use the intervention, grounds it in, in their culture and our lives. So what is our model? We have a, a, a constant interplay between the designer, the implementer, and the participant. And one of the things that we often assume is that the participant is a passive recipient. And one of the reasons we argue that for social diffusion is because the intervention gets taken by the participant, as all communication does, and acted on, on. And so it's not just filtered through their cognitive patterns, it's filtered through their behaviors, particularly as they leave it and discuss it with other people. Almost all health messages are filtered in, in that way. Uh, in addition, um, a major part of this are the organizational cultures. Now, limited in the way I could graphically represent this, because there should be many bubbles there. Maybe I could get a bubble machine and float them out and have them occupy the screen that way. Because um, various different organizations, various constituencies are involved, and they all have their own cultures, and they all come together in different ways. It's something to illustrate as we go through this. So what are some of the challenges to this engagement? Um, identify and recruiting organizations, changes in leadership and structure. So that study that I, I mentioned to you where we're going back to people that were in our recent trial, um, 
I, about half of the principals are gone five years later. And so the leadership of the schools has all changed and with it, um, uh, various different, a very different approach to conventions, prevention sometimes. Um, and the question becomes where to engage uh, organizational members. When we recruit schools, sometimes we start with the superintendent and sometimes the school board and sometimes the principals and occasionally just the teacher uh, will bring us in. And the key is balancing the needs of all these organizations, coordinating activities among the various constituencies, sharing time and resources and making sure we're not over challenging anybody and over taxing them. So um, some examples uh, of this were developing and adapting Keeping It Real. As I mentioned, it was originally created in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, a, a, a local uh, high school created the videos there for the middle schools, it was used in the middle schools. Initial study that I showed you the uh, graphic of uh, the results got us into NREF and recently was adopted for rural Ohio and Pennsylvania, engaging rural kids and creating their own videos. The structure stayed the same, but the content and the narratives and the um, exemplars changed as we, as we adapted it. And, and then on the ongoing process of using it, the kids' own stories adapted to their own local school cultures and their communities as, as it got used. So, um, we have the implementation adaptation processes, dissemination processes, and then finally, um, the, the biggest challenge and the biggest change was when Dare America adopted our curriculum for national um, dissemination. I think many of you know the history of Dare. I won't go into that, um, but they had decided that rather than being a curriculum development or a curriculum per se, they would be a dissemination channel for an evidence-based curriculum, and they chose keeping it real. I was at Penn State, Michelle and I were at Penn State at the time, and Penn State actually made it very easy for DARE to adopt it and facilitated that up to the point of conducting the research and adapting it. So at this point, there are elementary and middle schools and there'll soon be a high school version of Keep It Real that DARE uses. We use it nationally um, to about the tune of a million people and they use it in 52 countries around the world, some of which adapt it and some of which just translate it, which is an issue that we can talk about. And so that becomes the dissemination, the primary dissemination process to keep it real, but not the old one. So what did we do in Arizona and Pennsylvania to engage people? First of all, we had to, in, we had to uh, identify who was involved. Um, the project had started in ASU, so it still involved some coordination with what was going on in ASU, we had the teachers, the students, the school administrator, the counselors, the high school students who produced the videos. Um, high school students are, particularly high school creative students, uh, are an interesting group to deal with as well as their teachers. And, and it, it, it's a very different culture. And we try to uh, explain that this was their first professional experience and we were the producers. And some of them were happy with that and some of them weren't. So to give you an example of the kind of challenge you face, and there's a picture of a professional videographer we hired to work with students in, in the rural communities. Um, there was a, a different set of challenges. So we made the assumption that we had uh, these constituencies with DARE and um, we were wrong. DARE is a very complex organization. Uh, what you know is DARE uh, is a program that is administered by something called DARE America, which has 14 employees and runs the entire program but has educators that they license to. And then there are some DARE trainers that work either with DARE or with state organizations. The DARE officers all report to sheriffs and chiefs. They're all local, they're not part, they're only part of DARE in that they're trained by DARE and certified by them. There are DARE state organizations. And so DARE itself is a complex organization with many, many layers and levels. And since they had been doing prevention for almost 25 years before they joined us, they had very specific ideas about what prevention was, what drug prevention was, and how it should be done. And very clear ideas about what they thought the officers were capable of doing. Um, clearly the prevention community filtered this, and the media, which uh, continues to cover there on and off, was an influence in what we could or could not do. So it was a pretty complicated process of working with everybody, and at the same time staying true to our prevention theory and our prevention strategies and making a curriculum 
that worked with DARE, for DARE, but with the schools and for the teachers and the students as well. Um, there are also some limitations because DARE is in the schools and there are parents who are suspicious of officers being in the schools and that's why the parents are up there as well. So one of the advantages of working with a group like uh, DARE is that they can produce colorful booklets and videos and, and make things look really good, whereas um, you're, you're more limited when you're just using NIH money in what you can get done. So um, at the same time, we have been involved with a number of other projects that involve this model. Um, we have an HPV vaccination project that started with uh, a doctoral student, so on Hofer of Penn State, who is now a faculty member at UC Irvine. And the initial vaccine, HPV vaccine intervention was five minutes long, and it doubled the uptake of the vaccine in a clinical trial, which was amazing. And we have since partnered with Planned Parenthood and the UC Irvine and a company called St. Andrew's Development that creates kiosks and uh, uh, laptop-based interventions, look alive films, Penn State, to uh, disseminate this through Planned Parenthood. We had a uh, phase one SBIR that allowed us to develop it and pilot test it. Um, Planned Parenthood is a very interesting organization to work with. Um, UC Irvine had their own ideas about how the partnership should work. St. Andrew was very cooperative, but they're uh, a technology company. And we did work with Look Alive Films before. The gentleman you saw that I showed you in that previous slide is the head of Lookalike Films. And um, at one point, Penn State was involved in this project, but no, no longer. Um, and so that was an interesting transition as well. Um, while we were doing the pilot work at Planned Parenthood, their clinics were being picketed every day. And um, it made for an interesting environment to be working in and doing health promotion. Also, we've also been involved with a group at the University of Miami in the Miami schools doing Latina sex education through interactive video game. We have a media literacy substance abuse prevention program that partners with 4-H that was initially developed out of Rutgers University and, and partnering with us and now involves the University of Missouri and um, a, a company called Lean Forward that's a, that's a web designer. And um, we've been, as I mentioned, developing a high school substance abuse prevention program with another um, small business called Prevention Strategies, and that's through there, and Rutgers is also involved in that. And so all of these projects involve various different constituencies, and trying to manage and balance the needs of, of them is always a challenge. So just to give you an idea of what goes on when, you, um, when you're doing this, this kind of work, I, this scroll is uh, an exemplar of all of the different partners at various stages in in um, oops, sorry about that in, in the process and so what what we have is a situation where you start off thinking that you're going to build these interventions and then you're going to get them on these lists and then people are going to want to use them and you're going to say here use them um, you try to do that and, and if you're a university professional like us, I was, the university wants to know how, who's going to pay for all the copying and the mailing and the shipping and everything else that goes on. And so you start to charge for them and then you have to take money and it has to be processed through university and, um, or whatever entity you create. And so it's not as straightforward or easy as you think it is because, um, because you don't have the resources. At the same time, you find that when you do that, it's only used in fragmentary ways, and in part, it's done that way sometimes because you didn't take the end user in, in account when you began the process. And so if you don't study and understand how teachers teach in a classroom and how prevention curriculum, for example, get ado adopted and used in schools and how curriculum wind up being disseminated through the social networks of kids, then what you've created is going to be misused probably in all likelihood. One of the advantages of the DARE system, for example, is that DARE requires 80 hours of training and people flunk DARE training. They go to DARE training and they are sent home and said, no, you cannot be a DARE officer. There have been a number of studies of DARE officers and the fidelity is, and the quality is exceptionally high. 
So the, a dissemination, as a dissemination vehicle, I have a lot more faith in that model than I do when, when I go out and I train teachers in, in middle schools, which we still do some of. Um, the other model that we work with is, is trying to create web-based uh, curricula. And the, you have more control because the user has to go through it in the order you specify and can't, and can't, uh, can't skip around or stop using one of them and, and be um, designated as having completed it in any way. Um, there are, of course, issues about web-based design and how effective it might be, and, and that uh, research technology is, is obviously still emerging. But uh, hopefully, um, hopefully, the, the, you know, as we develop and, and learn effective means of engaging people in that in that manner, it provides a mechanism for having more control over your implementation and knowing how the end user will be using it. Um, I, I would also point out that the the narrative approach that we use and the kid-centered approach, where the materials come from the globe, from the kids that are using it, it is a, a strategy for. Um, almost self-adaptation. -adapt so if you have a, a multicultural curriculum, and, and by the way, the mo I guess I forgot to mention was that the multicultural curriculum worked more effectively than the ones that were targeted specific groups, even on those groups. So we had a curriculum developed for and by Latino kids. And the multicultural curriculum that was involved Latino, African-American, and white kids worked better on everyone, including the Latino kids. And so you have a, a curriculum that if it involves various elements of the target audience has aspects that all the targets can relate to. And if it's a narrative approach, then they're filling in the stories and they're localizing it at the same time. And so it becomes a, a vehicle for um, building adaptation into the design of the curriculum in a way that, the, that privileges that, that product and so that they don't have to go out and redo it themselves or change the materials. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that's really, really important. Um, we find, for example, in our research that um, implementation quality, which includes both fidelity and the how well the program is delivered, um, totally mediates the program effect. And I think that the flossing example is a, is a good one. If it's not done well, it's not going to work. And I think that makes us revisit a little bit about what we mean by implementation, fidelity, inflation quality, and what we mean by, quote, evidence-based. So um, those are my major points, and I think at this point we should go to the questions. Thank you, Mike. Um, I believe for everyone that's online that um, there's a chat that you can pull up um, for questions. and. Michael, I think you can see those. Is that correct? Uh, we'll, we'll, read them. Well, we we'll read them to you. We'll field them. Okay. I noticed you made some notes. Did you have a question? Yeah, so I'm going to start uh, with a question just to, as people are queuing up in the chat, and then we'll read those as they come up. Um, well, Michael, one of the things that struck me, um, first of all, I mean, obviously the, the, the incorporation of stakeholders early and often and throughout the process, I think, is a really nice illustration of how to do that and making sure you're paying attention to who's receiving it and who's delivering it and all the sort of things as you're developing the intervention. I was struck by the, it sounded like there was some tension as you move from the traditional university setting to community and business-like settings for the dissemination and implementation part of this. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, Universities like Penn State are not set up to disseminate uh, prevention materials or any other sort of health materials, in, in my experience. And um, while they were cooperative in licensing the curriculum to DARE, they were not very helpful in getting it out. And so, for example, I never knew what schools were licensing the curriculum. You know, mm -hmm. Every once in a while, they'd send me a list. I knew the list was not completely accurate because schools had contacted me. Um, the question becomes, for example, as a university professor, I can't travel around the country and train people. How do I hire trainers? You know, how do I set up a training network? Um, people would be asking for all kinds of evaluation materials. Uh, the university was not thrilled at my giving those things away. They wanted me to start doing research, but these people had to be able to prove to their constituencies the program was working, so they needed tools for things like that. Um, 
It was a major reason that I am no longer any, in a university, that I'm in a small business, because it allows me much more flexibility to do what I want to do. And um, so uh, the small business framework, we're an LLC, allows me to um, run, my, my, run my program the way we, Michelle and I run our program the way we want to run it, and who we, how we want to run it, and when we want to run it, and who we want to license to it. Um, it provides other challenges because you're a business at that point, but um, so far, so far, so good. Good, good. Well, and, and I know there's other, that question's already queuing up, so before I turn it over to Bill Elwood to read a few of them, just, just as a follow-up to that, the, um, I mean, obviously not everybody who develops and evaluates an intervention is going to be able to shift into a business model in order to be able to do what you did to deliver it, but so your thoughts just about I mean, we obviously don't have the sort of the infrastructure for prevention delivery systems and that sort of thing. So your thoughts about sort of how we might be able to construct something like that, or what that needs to look like? Yeah. Well, I, I should start with some uh, kind of war stories that they shared with me when they went on NREP and called people about their various curriculum. One developer who was on the list told them they were not interested in spending any uh, another one said, uh, well, let me go into my garage and see how many copies I have left. Um, uh, a third said, I can do this, but don't tell my co-developer because uh, we're, in, we're in lawsuits against each other. Um, and so I, I think from the beginning, you have to think about if you're developing something to disseminate it, to take it to scale, that has to be part of the initial process. You have to be very clear with your co-developers, anyone who works on it. You have to be, um, you know, when we have an IP lawyer that we pay a lot of money to now because um, that becomes a huge pr a part of what, what we do. Um, I think if I, was develop if I was in university and I didn't want to leave a university, I would probably find a company like mine, and there are a number of them, Prevention Strategies, who we're partnering with to do the, um, the high school curriculum has been in business for a while, and they, they do amazing work. I mean, Gil Botvin spun off life skills development and high school training. So there are a lot of companies that, that do things like this. And I think the easiest way would to have, to have it be co-owned and so the university um, doesn't have the full copyright and can't control what you do. So I hate to be a little bit blunt about that, but that's what I would say. That's very helpful. Good. Bill? Thank you. Um, one of our, our, our first question that came in asked about the time between uh, um, your initial research project and then your turn w uh, toward uh, um, dissemination. Yeah, well, it was an interesting process because we were in Phoenix and because there were so many Latinos in our curriculum, um, it became the only curriculum initially on NREP that had a Latino audience. And so school districts around the country began contacting us almost immediately. And um, I, you know, I didn't know what to do. You know, Michelle and I were lost. And so we began to kind of puzzle through this right from the beginning, Bill. And we did go through Penn State's office. They, were, you know, they have an office of contracts. They were somewhat helpful, but they had no real experience with this either. And so they were treating it like any other contract they might have with a business. And this is not the same thing because it's a curriculum and you have to train people and you have to provide them with materials, et cetera. So um, the, the process started immediately, and it was not something we had anticipated, and no one told us to, to anticipate. I mean, now, I mean, I think fortunately there are people like Erwin Sandler and Mark Greenberg and others that have been talking about this, this issue quite, quite widely, and you know, NIH has been uh, doing a good job of trying to get the word out that when you create something, it might be effective, and it might go to scale, and you should kind of think about that when you begin. So that's a recommendation you might have for more health promotion researchers is to be ready earlier. Uh, absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, no one goes in this thinking they're going to fail. We all think we're going to go in there, we're going to create interventions, and they're going to make change the world and save lives and produce new theories and, and do all the wonderful things that we intend to do. And if you go in there thinking that, uh, then you better think of what's going to happen with it when you're done. Nice way to uh, put that. Thank you. 
Uh, we have a question about uh, um, how to describe the message development uh, um, process, particularly with the young people. Uh, um, how much control did they have over creating the message? And uh, although uh, our, our guests did not ask it this way, you might revisit what real what what the letters of real stand for and how that those letters inform how you taught your participants to create their own messages. Right. Yeah. Excellent question. Yeah. So we started off. Um, it's an interesting story. Michelle was a master's student interested in performance and how it impacted people's lives, so particularly performing personal narratives. She's coming into the doctor program. She says, you know, just say no is, you know, pretty big in the prevention community now. And we could study how kids say no. And then we could create performances of it. And so the, the basic approach that we have when we create and adapt and that is to start with narrative interviews of kids and kids from the basic target audience. Um, it's not easy to get, particularly even middle school kids, they're not easy at all with elementary, very difficult with elementary. So you have to have talented narrative interviewers and you have to have people like Michelle who are incredible at looking at narratives and picking out prototypical narratives. And so we developed conversational strategies, which our media advisor told us we had, an ac had to have an acronym and they became Refuse, Explain, Avoid, and Leave. They had other more technical names in the beginning when we were like being the scholarly community that we thought we were to begin with. And so real became named as uh, refuse, explain, avoid, and leave. And then we took our findings about these strategies back to the kids to kind of member check them as you do in this kind of work research. And they came up with the expression keeping it real to name the program. So came, right from the beginning that came from the kids. The initial, this, not this logo, but the initial logo was created by, by kids. So then we took the narratives, the stories, and we took four or five stories for each of the letters. And we went to the, this high school, this program arts high school, and we said, we want you to write a script, a script around real, a script around explain, a script around avoid, a script around lead. And we want, you know, we want one script that targets these, so these four or five Latino narratives. And then we were going to create one for the white kids because in Phoenix, that's 90 something percent of the market. And here's where, you know, so the kids created the name, they did the logo, but the performing arts students said, we will not work on this unless the African American kids are included. Well, what do you mean? There's only five, four percent African Americans in the middle schools of Phoenix. They said, well, there's a lot of African Americans here and African American culture is really big in our lives and you need to rethink this. And so Michelle and I went back and we said, oh, yeah, they're right. And so when we created the multicultural version, what we did is we created a version that targeted Latinos. Then we created a second version. We were going to first just target whites, then targeted blacks and whites, and then we created a multicultural version for all of them. And the, the fact that it, that it was created that way was shaped by the kids and their opinions about their culture and their lives. The lessons were similarly developed where we would draft things with the teachers and then have them go through it and say, how would you teach this? And then we listen to them talk about how they would teach it and incorporate that into the way the message is constructed. The reason it's not, and I don't use CPPR, is that this prevention strategy comes from Michelle and I. And in right. most cases, the lessons and the topics that we cover, the fact that we highlighted risks and risk and consequences and, and the kids thinking about that and making decisions and relationships and conflict and teaching the resistance strategies came from our prevention strategies. And so we work with people and they, those topics do get, get modified somewhat. But the prevention strategy, I think, comes from the researcher and from the designer. If you saw that model with three parts. And, and, in, and then the, the curriculum itself gets developed in, in collaboration with others. At least that's the way I see it. That sounded spot on. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, this next question follows on very nicely in, in that how do you and Michelle as researchers maintain your influence over the, desi the evidence-based design when, when there are, you know, when you turn it over to the schools and leave or as it gets disseminated through the the DARE trained officers who of course are reporting to their precinct captains or whoever 
And if indeed there are, do you get findings from these evidence-based practices that may lead you and Michelle and your other collaborators to get new theoretical insights? Do you get data from people on the ground who are also administering it on the ground? Well, I, I think that we've published a couple of papers on implementation practices, and I think that, again, under NIH's lead leadership, there's this emerging interest in a field called implementation science, and so we're beginning to, you know, basically get a descriptive basis of understanding and developing a theory of implementation, which I think we're way far away of. Um, so one of the studies, we had teachers videotape themselves teaching it. We train them, give them the curriculum, and there's a teacher, and he sets the camera up in the back of the room. You see him walking away from the camera. He walks to the front of the room. He opens the curriculum manual. Now, every lesson ends with role playing because we want the kids to practice the skills they've learned. He, so he shuffles through the manual till he gets the role play. He smiles and looks up at the class and says, Today we're going to do a role play. You can't <laughs> practice something you haven't learned. Um, he's on tape. He's just turned the camera. It's not like we turn the camera on. Um, so basically the story says you lose a lot of control. You lose a lot of control when it's out there. And unless you program it through a website or something like that, I'm not sure or, or you know, you do some, you, know, so you watch them teach it, which we were actually doing, and they still weren't teaching it always the way we wanted. You lose a lot of control. Um, the big thing that went on with Dare in the beginning was um, our curriculum is based around these student, these kids, and the narratives and uh, social influence and social muscle learning and things like that. It's not based on giving the kids drug information and hoping that they'll take the information to figure it out themselves. And there had gone away from an information-only model a couple of iterations ago, but there was still a lot of belief in that. And officers still inserted a lot of drug information into our curriculum, which is not good because it's not, it's, it has to be, it's taught didactically, and it's not even the style of, so we have a narrative content, we have a narrative style of teaching. And so on two dimensions, it's a divergence from what we're doing. Um, the good thing is that officers are well-trained, and when they've been studied, they tend to do it the way you want to do it. And so you, if you can find a partner that has a good dissemination model, then you're lucky. But most of us are going through schools, and if teachers teach it, they're going to change it. And frankly, when we studied them changing it, they said they changed it to adapt to the classroom. But when we observed them teaching four or five classes and making the same change each time, we knew they were changing it to fit their own teaching style and not to change it to the particular classroom they were teaching. So um, I, I, I think there are some strategies. Find a good dissemination partner. You can program some of the stuff. If you have a video up and they, show, they have to show the video to get into the lesson, you're controlling some of the content. But, you know, the reality is, again, the research shows they use segments of this. They might use three lessons out of ten, combine four different prevention programs together, and uh, it's still a difficult challenge. And so I've now exhausted my knowledge of my answer to your question, Bill, unfortunately. That, that's just fine. Did, did, is there anything else that comes to you off the top of your head that, uh, uh, that facilitate the successful implementation and sustainability? Well, again, you know, if you, it's the partnership. You know, so we're working with 4-H, and when we, in the pilot studies we've done, they're involved in creating it. And so it fits the way 4-H runs. And so it's easier for them to use it and more natural for them to use it. And I, we're hoping that the same thing is happening with the Planned Parenthood intervention. Um, the, the, the sex education intervention is an interactive video game. So um, if they play the game, then it controls what they actually do. So there are some technological ways of doing it, and there are some cultural ways of building into the system. And that's what I would advise at this point. Does anybody in here have a question while I figure out what to do with this lady? Uh, I've got a really long question from Suzanne Spear. Uh, um, that's very specific. I will 
Suzanne, I will do email me at william.elwood at nih.gov. William has two L's. Elwood has one. Uh, um, there's a period in the middle. Uh, I will uh, connect you to Michael Hecht about your specific uh, um, project with young people. Uh, um, Thank you, Bill. Sure. It's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, it was interesting. It was, it was oh, very interesting. Is there any information on socioeconomic status uh, um, and peer interface and to the health belief model and peer interface? Uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, We've not directly addressed those those constructs, and so we haven't. Um, there are some faith-based organizations that have adopted Keep Your Real. We don't have a lot of information about what goes on in, within them. Um, we have not specifically looked at kids of different socioeconomic statuses, although clearly some of us, I mean, Phoenix was 36 schools. Most of them were in the city, but there was some variation in the um, SES there. And you know, my my argument would be, if you if you collect the narratives from kids across groups and create a multicultural intervention, you are safer, and your intervention can be more widely used. Um, on the faith-based side, though, you might want to be tapping into some of the um, the resiliencies that are built into that community, and that would require a more targeted approach, is what I would say. But I don't have any other information than that. Okay, great. Allison Brown says, uh, uh, gives you a compliment that just about everyone else writing in has uh, started their questions with, and that is, what a great program with Thank one you. or more exclamation points depending on the, uh, uh, um, on the commenter. And, and so I, I thought it was about time to share that with you. Uh, um, Alice wants to know, to what degree did parents participate or provide feedback? and uh, um, uh, either in the intervention or regarding their children's participation? Um, well, first of all, thank you everybody for the exclamation points, and I will pass it on to the team because it's a team-based approach. Um, we have some, uh, there are some places within the, the curriculum where there are, there are activities or there are exemplars or role plays that involve the parents, but it's not, at this point, it's not highly connected to family communication. Um, and those of you who know Michelle Miller Day know that she's one of the leaders in studying parent-child communication about alcohol and other drugs. And we have been working towards integrating more of that into what we're doing. Um, the, the approach, if it's school-based, is that within the school, if it's their curriculum, we don't need, they don't need parent approval for that. What you need parent approval for is participating in the surveys. Um, I can tell you that it doesn't stop parents. I mean, I can tell you one particular parent, they called me and asked me why I, Michael Heck, was teaching my, their child's class, which I wasn't doing, their teacher was doing it. I'm not sure why that, how that got filtered to the parent. The parent was irate that I was coming into class and taking up class time and teaching this stuff. Um, I tried to talk to them, I, I you know, expressed, what, what I explained what was happening. So there are times when parents have a voice that way. But at this point, um, there is not a big parent or family component, except for the hope that they will disseminate, diffuse, and talk to their parents about it, and some little activities that we do that attempt to encourage them to do that. Okay, great. Uh, um, have you looked at the spontaneous adaptation of theory by practitioners, uh, um, how and where they find additional information when they're teaching it themselves? And, and how can they facilitate it? The study we're currently doing, and Felipe Castro of Arizona State is taking the lead on this, and going back to the schools and talking to them, we'll get more at that than, than what we currently do. Um, there are a couple of studies, like Chris Greenwald has one, um, uh, and Ennert has another one, that look at the schools and do surveys of principals. Um, school culture and principal support is a big, um, a big factor in how and when curriculum gets used, but 
that you know we, we just don't know a whole lot about that. And, and as I said, we, you know, we, we originally were going to unpack the, the findings for the implementation study we did by looking at the teachers and how they were constructing the curriculum by how they were changing it on an ongoing basis. But it turned out that they would make one adaptation and then stick with it, teach it that way five times. So it didn't give us enough data to, to really get anything other than teachers that wanted to lecture more, drop some of the interactive components out, and P teachers that were highly interactive spent more time on discussion and things like that. So I'm sorry. I, I wish we had, we, we thought we would have more information from you, but we don't. Hopefully we will soon. Or you will. For us. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned this in your presentation, and I think that at least one of your answers, but you might have something to add given this question. Uh, um, I'm, I'm wonder, uh, uh, do you have anything else to add regarding in this dissemination process when it gets, when, when people pick it up, when the DARE, when teachers continue to teach it long after you're gone or the officers are teaching it in faraway places, uh, um, do you have any idea about the uh, um, uh, about the long term efficacy of your intervention? Um, have, you, do you have any experiences, either anecdotal or data driven, about that? We're just starting that process through Dare, and so the first study looked at the new elementary curriculum and showed that the curriculum impacted the the new skills, the media, decision making, and communication, and things like that. And we're hoping to go into a field with a long-term study. There is a challenge because they created their international uh, program as a charity, as a giveaway. Uh, they charge very little. They charge like a dollar twenty-five a kid for participation. In it. They're probably the cheapest curriculum around. Um, I mean, it's basically the cost of doing business is what they charge. Uh, the international one, the, they give them the curriculum and they use it. The recent, they recently have created um, an online version of the elementary curriculum, and when that gets used internationally, it will have to be translated by the web with us and the web uh, development people. And so we'll have more information about that process and how well it works in three to five years. But um, that is also one of the, again one of the ways of explaining how it gets used in the field is by creating a format in which the implementer has less control. You know, there still has to be room for the kids to tell their stories, given our approach. So um, there's still room for the, the implementer to have a lot of effect on what we're doing. Did I missed part of the question, or did that cover it? Okay. Uh, um, this is much more targeted, so Chin Chin. Uh, um, Chin Chin Shi uh, uh, would like to know if, if uh, um, you think Keeping It Real has any implications for other behavioral health issues, perhaps uh, um, recognizing and dealing with depression, uh, um, uh, performance anxiety in schools for projects, uh, other kinds of, of mental health issues that pertain to kids. Yeah, unfortunately, we've not been able to study that yet, in part because of the length of a survey that requires just the evaluation component. We look at the mediators and then the outcome variables. Um, we've tried using John Graham's three-form design, where right. there's a random system for giving everyone the core questions, and then everyone else gets a third of the each and uses the missing data uh, indicators to calculate it. But even then, you're, you're looking at 100 items for kids, and that's an awful lot. So we've not been successful at doing that to date. It's, um, I, you know, you think that when you're teaching kids to assess risks and consequences, make decisions, communicate effectively, establish relationships, uh, find social support, find and give social support, and things like that, and other, you know, the, the various different social emotional skills where you're managing emotions and things of the, that nature, that it would generalize, but we've not been able to study it yet. Okay. Uh, um, uh, understandable. And uh, another rave that, uh, um, what a brilliant example of translating scholarship in meaningful ways, exclamation point. Uh, um, Thank you. And a, a, a great riff on on narrative, uh, um, but it would be preaching to the choir as well as to the preacher. Uh, um, what kinds of she continues? What kinds of things have you all done to try to educate teachers in enabling 
student agency in the process? Well, it's when just we're, when we're, examples of of young people chiming in and saying for and and I mean they already in a in a Burkean way have more than enough agency by saying, no, there may be five African Americans in this school, but we're going to include them in the intervention. There could be more introverted, introverted children that you may have, that, that may have needed to be coaxed into that. Right. right. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, for one thing, assertiveness is covered in the curriculum. So we try to develop assertive communication skills. So that on one level that you just have it right there. Um, the coaching of the, the teachers occurs during the training when we teach about narrative health and narrative messages. And in the structure of the intervention, where it starts off with a problem, a problematic situation that kids face. So um, there's one situation where the girl is asked by the teacher to help out by like cleaning the, the, the board and things. And her friends stand at the side in the door teasing her and her feelings are hurt. And, um, and then the students are presented with a situation and then they have to unpack it. What's happening? What are the various strategies? What would you do? And then out of that, the teacher is coached to draw. We give them PowerPoints then because we can usually anticipate what the kids are going to say um, to unpack what's happening that leads into a discussion of the skill, practice of that skill. And then the, in this one case, in, in the elementary curriculum, the, it's presented through a, uh, an animated cartoon in the beginning, and then the actors who the car are played in the cartoon appear at the end and talk about their experiences and then lead on to the next activity. So the structure of the lesson in some ways leads the implementer into a narrative framework, into engaging students, into having students become part of the curriculum and their, themselves and their lives become part of the curriculum. That um, doesn't mean they have to do it, but it, it it, it's structured for them to do it, and they're taught to do it. Okay, nicely done. Speaking of of young people and multimedia, uh, young people and, and even people older than young uh, live lives very much online and digitally. Uh, um, does it is real prevention or other uh, disseminators of keeping it real? Are, are there are there digital versions of that? Are there social media communities? Are there are there Twitter chats? Other sorts of ways that uh, um, that can build this drug free community of support. That, that that's kind of what's exciting about the Dare uh, partnership because Dare and um, a company called Verisim have created an online version of the curriculum and then. Uh, so it, it's taught it's taught online and and the kids can engage it. And then there are apps that, so for example, a, di a decision making app that encourage the kids to take decision making skills and practice them and use them outside the context of the classroom. Uh, it, it, I've been less successful at the school, the pure school, give it to the schools and get them use it. We try to create support groups and at least for the teachers to provide technical support, and that's been pretty uh, pretty bad failure. Um, the 4-H curriculum, which is called Real, Real Media, is about media literacy, and that's the one we're in the process of fin doing it, finalizing and doing a, a study of. And um, that curriculum is, is about the way the media influence them and how they can create messages to counter-argue and counter-respond to the media and then disseminate those messages to their friends and their families. So it has the agency that you're talking about. It has the online component and the web-based component and the use of the social media, all built into the design of that curriculum. Great. Great. Michael, thank you. Um, we're, we're short on time at this point, but I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank you for such a great presentation for our inaugural webinar. Thank Bill Elwood for moderating and trying to read text on a uh, screen that I can't read from where I sit. Um, so well done as well on that part. Um, and um, the people on, uh, in the chat rooms can only do exclamation points, but those of us in the office can certainly clap. And thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I, I'm happy to respond to emails if they get forwarded to me.
So thanks so much. I appreciate thanks. it. Um, just a reminder to everybody that's online before you go off, our next uh, webinar is October 25th. Uh, Benjamin uh, Julbagovic, I think, I had that correctly, is that too bad for Czech? Uh, Rational Decision Making in Medicine, a Neglected Topic will be our presentation on October 25th. So thank you all, Michael, thank you again for your time and uh, your presentation, much appreciated. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Do you want me to stay on, Isabel? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I think you're good. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.